So yesterday, what we did is we talked, we took a focus from IMFs and we took a focus on, well, how do IMFs and gas laws help us explain solutions in general, the interaction between particles in a homogeneous mixture, basically, right? And so we took some time to define some terminology and define various ways that we can measure it. And molar solubility is the way that we go because it just happens to be the most conventional way. And a lot of our solutions tend to be liquid-based solutions, some sort, solid plus liquid, liquid plus liquid. You can have gas solutions as we know, you can also have solid solutions, but in chemistry, we tend to work with a ton of liquid-based solutions, okay? Liquid-based mixtures. So we practice just doing some basic molar solubility calculations and unit conversions, okay? Getting our solubility of solute over solvent, essentially, um, into the proper units, okay? And then we went into, okay, there's a way that we can label within a range of whether something is soluble, low soluble, or insoluble with each other, okay? And remember, miscible and immiscible is specific to liquids, but if you're talking like a liquid-liquid solution, but if you're talking about liquid plus anything else or any other type of state of matter involved, you use the term soluble, insoluble, and low solubility or low soluble, okay? Um, and we looked at some examples. We looked at how might we categorize and understand molecular solid dissolving, or molecular solid mixtures. Uh, we talked about for pretty much liquid liquid mainly, how we might predict solubility based off of polarity. And then we talked about how ionic compounds and their ion dipole attractions um, further can be explained using our understanding of solutions, okay? And we went into the subcategory of understanding where we said, you know, and it's kind of cool actually studying ionic compound solubility because we see that one of the reasons why it's so unique is that it actually takes on different properties when it is dissolved and creates a homogeneous solution, okay? And that's what kind of went into yesterday. And then we did some calculations about calculating the amount of ions free floating that dissociate in aqueous water-based solution for an ionic lattice structure being dissolved, right? And then I went into kind of like, and by the way, there's also conductivity with certain acids and bases because technically strong acid and bases are a type of ionic compound. So they, be, they display the similar behavior um, when it comes to dissolving into a homogeneous solution, aqueous solvent, okay? So, oh, <laughs> sorry, that's gonna be on the recording. Um, so, um, and then we moved on to say, well, what if I don't like how soluble something is? What if I want it more soluble? What if I want to create a greater amount of solvent to solute interaction? So right now my solute, solute interactions are more favorable than breaking everything up and getting it to interact with the solvent. Well, there are a couple of ways you can do it. All of which focus on increasing collision and interaction between the solute and the solvent, the small part and the major part. Okay. And um, there's some of them work for certain states of matter and some of them don't for other states of matter. So that's kind of something that you guys have to categorize. Big idea is gases are weird. Gases are different, okay? Um, and so, and we kind of already know that the fact that we had a whole subsection on gases in general. Um, but we introduced a solubility curve in general, which was another way of categorizing once you are considered soluble, how much solute we add we label at the point of solubility where we're at. So are we at the point of maximum solubility, saturated? Like I'm already soluble, have I added as much solute as possible into this given amount of solvent? No, I haven't? Oh, then I'm unsaturated, I could add more. I'm already a soluble compound and I could keep on adding because I just have enough solvent to interact with, okay? But if I over add, I'm super saturated. I start leaking out my solid. I start leaking out my solute. Okay, and that's where we saw that crystalline structure that I showed you in the bottle, which I totally was supposed to be cooler if I had remembered to heat it and cool it. <laughs> and so we looked at a graph called the solubility curve, which was an interpretation of how much solute for a soluble compound in water do I have and what point am I at? On the curve, saturated. Under the curve, unsaturated. Over the curve, super saturated. Okay, and then I kind of took a little side note and said, hey, there's actually this other terminology that we use to call any type of solid that leaks out of solution. 
any type of solid that suddenly formed out of solution that wasn't there before. We call it a precipitate. And precipitates are particularly useful for understanding ionic compound solubility. When an ionic compound, a salt crystalline structure is insoluble in water, we call it a precipitate. And we give it a little parentheses S to show the state of matter in a chemical reaction. Or if it is soluble, it's a completely dissociated ionic compound, we call it uh, aqueous, okay? So that was kind of the flow that we went through um, yesterday. And then I introduced the special nature of gas, okay? And the idea is that pressure and temp, temp has a bad effect on gas solubility because your gas particles will float out. And then temperature has also a negative effect on the solubility of gas-based solutions because you raise the temperature, you increase the particle movement, you increase it floating out again, okay? And so, and then I really pulled a quite the move on you. And I was like, oh, one last thing, one last thing about solubility. There's a specific type of lab experiment that is an application of the solubility and molarity of certain concentrations that we use to determine unknown concentrations. We take a known and we use it to determine an unknown based off of a chemical reaction that you don't know about yet. Okay, and the whole idea behind me introducing that little nice cherry bomb on the bottom at the end of it was to help you have a little bit of context for a problem I went through in the AP problem video, but it wasn't essential. It just would have given you a little bit more background. This concept of titration though with acid and bases, a type of ionic compound that can be soluble in water, okay? It's gonna have its own whole unit, like unit eight, baby. That's where it's at, all right? But uh, I was really debating about whether to give it to you, but I decided to do it. And I don't know if that was the right decision, but I did it, okay? So that's what we did yesterday. And again, apologies for how crazy it was. Um, yeah, so hopefully that offers you just a little bit of recap to kind of ground a couple things for you. Um, and now what we're gonna do is head into our discussion on how can we use solutions with an instrument known as the mass spectrometer to predict and explain concentration amounts for an unknown. And this is a little bit more straightforward than titration. This is, um, I think, a little bit more conceptual. Titration will be best understood once we do a lab on it, um, as well as once we put it in the context of acid base, all right? But that's what we're gonna head into today. So I asked you guys for the warm up to do practice problem 25 in the workbook and 29. So heading over to the workbook, do, 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 do. Okay, 25, uh, the molar solubility of uh, strontium carbonate is 2.4 times 10 to the negative fifth molarity at 25 degrees Celsius. And remember, solubility does depend on temp. So you'll often see solubility um, have a temperature condition given, okay? If it's not given, you can assume room temp or 25, 21 to 25 degrees Celsius, okay? What is the solubility in another unit, grams per liters? So hopefully all of you guys simply realize that 2.4 times 10 to the negative fifth moles per liter, which is molarity, you had to convert to get it into grams per liter, which means that you simply multiplied by the molar mass amount of grams all over moles to cancel out your moles. And what did you get for your value? 3.5 times 10 to the negative times 10 to the negative three grams per liter. Excellent, okay? Um, that's just two ways of saying the same thing. Depending on the lab you're in, depending on the purpose of your experiment, it might be better for you to be in grams per liters. It might be better for you to be in moles per liters. Like it, it doesn't really matter. It just matters according to the question what it's asking you, okay? Then I asked you to do 29. Oh, this question 27, this is just practice reading the table. So remember in your notes, you had a table for ionic compound solubility, predicting whether it's insoluble, low soluble, and so forth. This is what this problem is addressing is using that table in your notes, okay? But 29, now I asked you to practice the concept of ion dissociation, how we can use the mole to predict how many ions have now been dissociated in a given solvent, okay? And this was a math, right? Just pure math. So based on the balanced dissociation equation, uh, calculate the concentration of each ion in a solution of K3PO4. So we know that if K3PO4, okay, goes aqueous, what we're really saying is it breaks up into its ion, three K plus ions and one PO4 three minus ion, 
right? So we have this now ratio between the amount of ions we get from the solid compound, okay? And we say, all right, well, if I have a three molar solution of K3PO4, then to understand how many moles of actual K plus ions are now released in solution, okay, assuming full dissociation, full breaking apart of the lattice structure, I would say for every three K plus, or for every one K3PO4, I get three K pluses, and that cancels out my K3PO4, and I say I have six technically molar ions of K plus, potassium cation, right? Not too bad at all. It's just kind of confirming some concepts mathematically and how you can apply them, okay? And then PO4 should be real basic, right? For PO4, it becomes one PO4, three minus iron for every one K3 PO4. And you're gonna get that you have a three molar solution ion of uh, PO4, three minus, all right? So that was just me trying to get you guys into the math behind the concepts, yes. Yes, it does. Okay. Sachin? Yeah. Liam? Do you think you for doing math better than I can? I apparently added like an idiot. Okay, cool. Well, I'm glad that you're all better at mental math than your teacher. <laughs> okay. No one laughs? Okay, okay. <laughs> okay, so um, great. And then I did make a note that I want to cancel question 30. Um, it just is unnecessary for this unit, particularly because you're not your spring. So we move some things around for fall versus spring. We move this out of your spring schedule and push it to later. So um, question 30, we canceled for the workbook for now. Okay, perfect. So let's continue it on with our conversation about molarity and solutions. And we're gonna look at the more straightforward lab application of solutions uh, through beer spectrometry. And Hannah, you good? Oh yeah. If you need to stand up and write, you can do that. A lot of kids have done that in the past where they stand up and write at lab stations because you can't fall asleep standing up, you'll fall over. Your body will catch you. Okay, sounds good. All right, so last bit of notes. So um, dilutions, we can use a consistent linear decrease in concentration for the same solution to create a trend line that allows us to then in lab predict unknown concentrations for a given solution, okay? So um, big thing is we should all be familiar with the concept of dilutions because you guys, You've learned about just in basic English, right? Um, a dilution, right, is a reduced concentration, okay? So what we say is a diluted sample has the same mole amount of solute, but additional right? We all know this. This is just like the technical way of saying, it. but additional, okay, liters of solvent. So as you get more and more diluted, right, your molarity decreases. Really basic. We should feel really confident about this. Now, what's really cool is if you add a little color, okay, such as with transition metals that already have color, ions that contain colors, you can physically see the dilution on a, uh, on a color aspect. If we were to have an ion present or a compound that had a particular color to it, we could physically and quantitatively create a trend line that associated with the molarity that we could then use to solve for an unknown sample and be like, oh, well, if this is the general Okay, pattern, and I have this sample of, I know that is the same compound, the same solution. Well, I can just put it against it and figure it out, which sounds like dumb, but it, there's a lot of unknown bottles that we have in chemistry. Like I threw out a ton of them over summer and I was like, man, I hope this isn't like super toxic to the environment because I don't know what's in here. And it would have been really nice to know if, did someone just close the door on us? 
Oh. Interesting. Interesting. Oh, forces. So anyway, um, effect on molarity. Oh, I see I wrote it below. It decreases it, right? So there are two ways you can calculate for dilutions and samples, right? For a given sample, you can calculate it as M1V1 equals M2V2. The molarity and the volume associated with that molarity is equal to the product of the second molarity from the same sample that you want, most likely the diluted molarity of it, and the now probably greater volume of it to create a diluted sample, right? Um, it makes a lot of sense because molarity is moles over liters, volume is liters, you multiply it and you get moles. Basically, you're saying you have the same number of moles of whatever the salt responding to is on each side. Yep. Yep, yep. And then Charlie and I were talking about this, and there's another way that we can think about that it's going to align a little bit better in the future for acid base calculations when you're dealing with a ton of dilutions. But you can also write this as molarity, um, the one is equal to the molarity two, okay, times if you separate it, all right, volume two over volume one. And what you see is you get, you can use the ratio of the volumes to predict the second molarity. Okay, sounds really basic. And you're like, I didn't need to know this because it's just a manipulation of the equation. I just wanted to point this out because this is what we, the format that we use for future calculations so that you know that this is technically just an M1V1, M2V2 rearrangement, okay? Is it supposed to be M1 equals M2 or M2 equals M1? It doesn't matter. M1, M2 just means before or final. It doesn't really matter what you assign as two or one as long as you keep the volume that goes with it the same. Okay. Oh, it's um, kind of similar. No, that's a biochem with the assays and stuff. Yeah, that's pretty similar. But then you would have a different... Well, then you would dilute up. So what you do is you take one and then you fill up to a certain calibration mark on volume. You will have just diluted that theoretically half. Half and half and half. It's the same idea, just put more mathematically without less. Wouldn't it have a different ratio of molarity to volume? Uh, well, it's the product. So it's less about the ratio between the molarity and the volume. What I'm saying here is that the volume ratio tells you something, but the actual product between the moles, molarities, and the associated um, liter amount is not a ratio, it's a volume. Or sorry, it's a product. It's a product. It's a multiplication. And then, like, for zero dilution, it's the same volume, but then the molarity is giving you Well, for zero dilutions, you would just have the same molarity. I don't know. You can't have a different molarity if you don't dilute it at all. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, if you have, like, um, like one mole, and then two, two, the next one, and it's, like, half a mole, one, two, five. Yes, so I'm not sure what you're asking me. Oh, oh, I was like, when did we switch conversations? Um, uh, okay, and then so what's your question? <laughs> I don't really, I don't really understand what you're asking me. It doesn't. Molarity two is the next molarity. It's an adjusted molarity. But then, and then if we wanted to understand where it came from, we'd multiply by the ratio of the volume change. So the volume is oh yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, but it's less the concentration of the actual solute in there. So the molarity is changed. So the molarity is less, but we you, we do we accomplish that though through changing usually the volume. Serial dilution is like almost a different method where you're you're taking small bits of the sample and you're changing the number of moles of uh -huh. solute you have rather than changing the volume. Oh uh, 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 yeah. So chemistry we tend to change the volume, not the molarity. So bio with assays, yes, thank you. Bios with assays changes the molarity and then keeps it at the same volume producing the same effect, but we go from the other end. We say, here's a set six molar sample 
I'm just going to keep making larger amounts of it to dilute it down. Okay. You know, I just somehow mess up with the volume. No, that, that's, that's totally fair. So, um, okay, perfect. So uh, go ahead and do practice one through two. It should only take you a couple of seconds. Honestly, you could probably do practice one through three. You could probably figure this out. So go ahead and try that on your own. All right, guys. So for this problem, this problem, what'd you get for the volume? 70 liters equals volume two. I really don't care what you pair as one and two, as long as you keep the molarity with the same volume, okay? And then uh, last one, second one. We all got 2.4 molarity. I made it M1. Uh, okay. Sure. Rainier? Oh, you just the B flop flop? Okay. Uh, cool. If you did not get that, you should learn how to plug in into an equation. Okay. So, <laughs> so practice number three. Someone win. Practice number three is a nice little example of how we might combo dilutions with molarity ion concentration. So let's say you have a sample of 15 milliliters of three molar HCl that's added to 10 milliliters of two molar HCl, or sorry, calcium chloride. Calculate the concentration of each ion in the now mixed solution. Assume no reaction occurs. So we're just saying that everything stays dissociated. We're just now dumping two things. Okay. So the first thing you have to do is you have to determine the diluted molarity of HCl, because that's going to affect the molarity or the mole count of the ions that you have now. So what we say then for this one is, um, and yeah, what we say is the diluted molarity of HCl is three molar, okay, times, I'm going to do the ratio between them, between the two volumes. So it'll be uh, the ratio between the volume of originally 15 milliliters, okay, all over the now new total milliliters, which is 25 milliliters, right? And that's going to give me my new molarity, the diluted molarity, and I'm going to get 1.8 molarity of HCl. I'm going to do the same thing to calculate the new diluted molarity of CaCl2, that is now the molarity in solution, the mixed solution, okay? Because I can't calculate them separately. I'm asking what are the ion concentrations now in the mixed solution. So I have to account for the di dilution of it all. So uh, for calcium, it becomes, the original is two molar and I'm gonna multiply by the ratio of the volumes, old, okay, over new. And of course it makes sense that we should be getting a smaller number because you're diluting it all, right? So it's um, 10 over 25, giving us 0 0.8 molarity CaCl2. Now I'm asked to figure out whether the ion concentration, so I have a couple ions. Okay, here are my ion list. I have H plus ion. I have chlorine ion from both compounds. And I have a calcium ion from just the calcium chloride. Okay, so I need to figure out the concentrations of each of these. Notice the chlorine is going to come from both compounds. So we're going to have to recognize that and um, do the math accordingly. So what might help, and you guys don't know quite how to do this yet, but you'll learn. It's pretty obvious and I've already kind of been throwing it out there, is what is the ratio in general? So when we dissociate, HCl becomes H plus and Cl minus. We get a one-to-one -one ratio for both ions being produced given the compound it comes from, okay? For calcium carbon uh, chloride, why do I keep on saying that? We go from, to produce one calcium cation and two chlorine ions. Okay, that ratio of two to one is gonna matter, right? So then we say, now let's calculate the concentration of each ion given this breakdown of what it dissociates into and the ratios that we get from it, the molar ratios we get from it, the molar ion ratios we get. So we say, okay, for H plus, the amount of H plus ion in this mixed solution, in this diluted solution, is going to be equal to 1.8 molarity, the diluted molarity of HCl, times the molar ratio that I produce one H plus for every one HCl, giving me 
1.8 molar H plus. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. Um, also notice something, I bracket ions. Anytime you bracket a compound, you're talking about molarity of that compound. That's another uh, notation that we use is if something's bracketed, we're asking you to consider the molarity of it. Uh, this is different though, when Lewis structures you bracket, that tells me that it's a Lewis structure with a charge. So careful, we use brackets for different things. Okay, easy peasy, um, chlorine, right? The chlorine concentration in this diluted solution is gonna be equal to 1.8 molar HCl times, for every one chlorine, I have one HCl giving me 1.8 molar Cl minus. But notice, this is a solution whose other compound contributes chlorine as well. So I'm gonna switch over and say, well, the chlorine concentration also is equal to the diluted molarity of calcium chloride, which is 0 0.8 calcium chloride times for every two Calcium, uh, well, for every one calcium chloride dissociated, I get two chlorine ions, giving me 1.6 molarity chlorine minus, giving me a sum total, okay, of, good God, math, two, three point four molar Cl minus in solution, ion concentration. And then, of course, we do the standard normal thing uh, for Calcium, the final cat ion, the final ion that we haven't accounted for. 0 0.8, because it comes from the calcium chloride, times, okay, one calcium two plus, all over one calcium chloride, giving us 0 0.8 molar of calcium ion. Okay, and done. And I kind of did this step, right, adding all up here, all right? So that's just like kind of a nice example of how you might see both of those things, both of those mathematical processes combined into one problem. And that, by the way, this method is gonna be particularly useful when talking about acid base, okay? Um, so now that we understand how we calculate and determine dilutions and how they work in chemistry, which is usually just adding more volume, okay? Now let's get into, okay, how do we use this in lab? So this is really handy dandy way uh, it's called beer spectrometry or spectrophotometry uh, using Beer's law that we can create percentages in that. Okay. Particles. Where in the world are my notes? Da, da, da. Beer's law. Uh, particles can blah, 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 and blah, 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 be electron jumping. Oh, they can absorb and release. energy via electron jumping and photon absorption slash emission. So remember, uh, when we look at the energy and electromagnetic spectrum, right, uh, distinct energy, which is equal to H times new frequency, right? Um, distinct energies produce distinct light color. And that's dependent on, right, your unique chemical that you're looking at. So if we're trying to quantify the concentration of a particular chemical species, and it happens to emit a color, we can take the color intensity and say it's equivalent to the concentration of that compound in solution. Yes? Is this anything to do with the function that it has to do? Not really. But it's stemming off of the same principle that that explored. So Beer's law helps us do that. It takes this idea that, oh, I can associate a compound with a color. And if I can associate a compound with a color, I can associate the amount or the concentration of a compound present with the intensity of the color that it's demonstrating. So what Beer's law tells us is that absorption and transmission of energy uh, regarding absorption and transmission of energy, many solutions have distinct colors, okay? Um, and therefore, they have not only distinct light spectrum, right? Light spectrum from emission. Ooh, that doesn't look like a word. 
spectrum, but they also have distinct then absorption and emission. Because remember, I this probably comes from physics, right? When you have a color present, that color that you're seeing is the color that's being um, transmitted. Everything else is being absorbed. Okay. What's the little thing before emission? A slash. Um, I, I recognize that. I also recognize that the distinct does not look like distinct. It is distinct. It just doesn't look like it. Charlie, could you heat up my pasta? I'm so hungry. Yeah. The color, the color, um, the wavelengths of the light, they depend on like the energy difference between the orbs. Yep. 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 Yeah. Mm -hmm. In my little Percy lunch. I'm so hungry. Okay. So premise two that the beer's lot then takes and uses, okay, is that the color and concentration, the darker the color, the more concentrated. So we say the higher molarity. Okay. So what... Beer's law does is it takes these two premises and it connects them into a beautiful equation, okay? Um, and it applies, we built a whole machine around this too. The machine is called a spectrophotometer. And it tells us, or, oh, well, I, here's this, actually, I should say spectrophotometry because I'm talking about the method. Spectrophotometry is the method built around Beer's Law's connection or Beer's connection between color and concentration of a compound. Particularly, it has to be a colorful compound. This will not work if it's a non-color compound. If it's a non-color containing compound, this is pointless, okay? But it's a quantitative method of studying matter, and it particularly takes the transmittance absorbance of that matter to e make it equivalent to the concentration of that compound in solution. Okay, and so the goal is using this method called spectrophotometry partnered with Beer's law and his two premises, we're able to create a graph of absorbance or transmittance, but tends to be absorbance versus concentration to determine the molarity, okay, or rate even of a reaction, okay, um, and Essentially, we're creating a, a trend line. We, the goal is to get a trend line, boom, that we can predict things from. That is not a very straight line. There you go. Okay, that's the end goal. With absorbance on the side and concentration on the X, okay? So, um, rate of reaction is kind of a sneak peek into unit seven kinetics. Uh, sorry, unit, is it unit six kinetics? No, it's unit five and seven. <laughs> unit five and seven. <laughs> Sorry. So that we're not is our not our focus today. Our focus is this: the application of spectrophotometry for molarity determination. So a spectrophotometer is then the machine that we use, and I just bought one. I won a grant. So the spectrophotometer is the instrument that measures the absorbance or transmittance of the light. And we particularly um, prioritize absorbance. It's just convention. It, it, it's not like either one is better than the other. It's just conventionally, we prioritize graphing against absorbance, okay? And so I showed you a physical view of the machine. This is an old version. And this is what we call the cuvette, where we store our samples in. We store our samples in the cuvettes, okay? And there's a lot of like little tedious natures about how to handle a cuvette. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Okay. So, okay. So how does this work exactly? Mm -mm -mm. All right. So here's the thing. When we look at the spectrophotometer, the internal structure is it has a whole bunch of series of light. We set it. We set to a certain light what we call lambda max, okay? We set to a certain line. And this is our cuvette, our sample. And what we do is we shoot 
right through it. And we say to our, we say to ourselves by we, I mean, the spectrum drama reads it and says, okay, how much of those, of that light, okay, was absorbed by the sample, okay? And what that tells us then is the colors or the wavelength absorbed, okay? Uh, which by the way, is probably opposite of the color that you like have, right? Right, am I right? Am I thinking pigmentation? Think of, am I thinking art? Am I thinking this right? I think I'm right. Exactly, exactly. Okay. So, and that's red and that's given as a value. You could also set it to transmittance and say, well, okay, uh, when we transmit, what would be, what would pass through? Whatever wavelengths that pass through, okay? What other colors or wavelengths that pass through are the transmitted ones? And of course we know that the, sorry, I know it's split between pages. If you have a hundred percent absorbance, you're going to have no transmittance, like literally 0% transmittance. If you have a hundred percent transmittance, you're going to have 0% absorbance. Okay. For a given sample at a given wavelength. Okay. And so that's kind of how it works. Honestly, that's all you really need to know. If you really want to know more about that thing, uh, there are plenty of like YouTube videos explaining how they work, but I am not an instrumentation person. So I just learn how to work the machine. I do not know how it like bit by bit goes. Okay, yeah. Basically, like, would you use it to identify like, uh, a substance or? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, you can. That is super cool. Good job. Mm-hmm. So. Generally, what it would be used for. No, but you can. Because once I introduce the equation, you can. So, when you're setting it up, okay, what we have is in the machine, we have a monochromatic that is responsible, monochrome, monochrome matter. Map. Tur map tour. <laughs> that separates and transmits the specific wavelengths that we want that we set it to. That dial helps us set to what wavelength we want to shoot through. Okay. What color that we want to shoot through that sample. All right. So when we set it up, the first thing that we do is we always one have to determine why is this all going crazy? We have to determine a lambda max, but we also need to determine, first of all, control group, a negative troll. Okay, the negative control is what we call a reference blink. So we basically calibrate the machine is basically what I'm saying. All of this matters, by the way, why I'm going into such detail about how to run the darn machine is because this is a common lab FRQ where they ask you, hey, given these results, what possibly went wrong when running it? Okay, so we put in a negative troll reference blink and that tends to be water. Here's why. We need to calibrate the machine to actually truly have 0% absorbance and 100% transmittance for at that wavelength that we set, at that color wavelength. And so water is our control. So we say we calibrate it to the point where A is equal to 0 0.000. And it is usually to the third thousandth place, okay? And this, of course, would mean I have 100% transmittance and zero absorbance is our calibration point. And then I have another photo of how the monochromatic works. And then what we do is when we run it, once we've done that, we put our sample in. Okay, it's placed in what we call is the cuvette holder. Our sample is placed in the cuvette holder. Okay, and we set, select what we call the lambda max. Okay, the light wavelength that we're going to shoot through. But it's not just any light wavelength. It's the light wavelength that we have the maximum amount, okay, of absorbance. I think that's right. Yeah, the maximum amount of absorbance. So what we do is we set it to a wavelength that's the exact opposite of what water is doing. Water is calibrating to the maximum amount of transmittance. But when we're shooting light through and we're trying to register and read absorbance, we want to be at a wavelength whose natural setting is the max amount of absorbance so we're not missing anything essentially, 
that whatever we're setting through, and then as we dilute, we're getting the max amount of reading possible for what color is being um, kept in that solution, essentially, what's not passing through. So, and then you just measure and record. So choosing the max amount of wavelength is really, really simple, okay? What you tend to do is you tend to shoot it, okay, through uh, the spectrophotometer and you look for, um, you get a graph like this, where you're like, you shoot it through all these series of wavelengths, this sample, and you're like, which wavelength, which color light is going to be the most absorbed by my sample? You pick the color of light, the wavelength that has the highest absorbance for that sample, and you set that as the light that you set shine through in order to create your calibrated trend line, okay? And so what you would say is for this, this would be your lambda max. This would be the wavelength or the color you're gonna set your machine through and send through. Okay, so here it would be, I don't know, G will occurs. Like what, four? 456 or something, it would be approximately mm, 456 nanometers, which is closer to the violet zone, okay? And so choosing the wavelength is we always wanna choose the wavelength where maximum absorbance in solution in given solution or sample occurs. So that when we read and create our calibrated graph, we're saying that the highest concentration is truly being represented by the highest absorbance possible. If we don't do that, we are shifting everything off. Our calibration doesn't have a true uh, standard to it. Okay. So, um, and then I kind of answered my question here. It's 456 nanometers, which would be close to the blue-violet zone. Yeah. Yep, yep. Okay. So how does this all now connect us to an actual equation? This equation is known as Beer's Law, okay? Beer's Law is the summary and the mathematical derivation of what we see here in this instrument. And that is that absorbance is equal to what we call molar absorptivity, which is a constant. And, okay, it's a constant, times the path length of the cell, path cell length, which is by the way, just the length of the cuvette, it's usually one centimeter. Like the path cell length is how much does the light have to travel to the sample? Well, what's the size of the container that's holding the sample? Because liquid shape to the container, one centimeter deep tends to be it. Times the concentration. And what we see for a given sample is that absorbance and concentration are directly related, which is exactly what we would see in lab. This is just the mathematical summary of that. Um, molar absorptivity is actually where we could use Beer's law and spectrophotometry to identify an element from. So most of the time, most of the time we're focused on figuring out concentration. That's usually our focus. This is how we tend to use it. But in more advanced analytical chemistry, what Hayden was saying is so true. You could technically, if you knew the concentrations and you knew the absorbances, you could technically solve for uh, epsilon is what we call it, which is an identifying constant. It's unique to each element. Okay, in advanced. Okay, labs, you could solve for epsilon and therefore actually identify the compound you're working with based off of its epsilon value because it's unique to every compound. So yes, technically, this could also be used for um, spotting an unknown but we tend not to, our focus is uh, figuring out the concentration, okay? So you guys are actually already kind of familiar with Beer's Law because it was on your unit one at FRQ for depending on a version, but you didn't need to know how it worked to do the ans to answer the question. You just need to know how to read a graph, which is way before AP, right? Yes, Alok. Uh, 
Technically, they. Oh, why aren't all? It has to do with the st structure of the compound nature. That's all I'm going to say. Mm. I'm sure there's a more thorough answer. It's just not that important. Okay. So, applications we prepare solutions of a known concentration, analyze them at lambda max, plot absorbance versus concentration, then you get an equation. And that equation becomes a y equals mx plus b equation if you have a linear trend, which is the goal. You should be diluting a set difference every time. So then when we say, is your absorbance, is your y, and it equals your lambda, or sorry, not your lambda, but your epsilon. And L is equivalent to B, by the way. Path length cell could also be written as L. It doesn't really matter. That's like your slope. And your X is your C, your concentration. And you now have a beautiful linear equation that you can just use to predict all future unknown samples. And if you are slightly calibrated off this, uh, whatever your calibration starting point would be like the C on the Y equals MS plus B. Okay. Um, but our goal is to not have to adjust for too much. Like our goal is to be at 0% no matter what. So our, our Y intercept would be zero ideally. Okay. So, and then you got your slope of best fit and it, you can use it to predict X. So that's that. That's how we um, take solutions and turn it into a laboratory experiment uh, that's used for identifying and quantifying. Plus zero, that's the calibration point. Hopefully it's zero. You hope you did it right, you know? If it's not zero, then everything's kind of shifted. So it's a little funk dunk but you know. Um, so problem, uh, practice problems one, two, and three uh, will be your warm up tomorrow. And let me quickly go over errors. Oh, wait, not tomorrow. You should do them right now. Just kidding. Do them right now. Myself up for that one. So this one, you just had to recognize the Y equals MX plus B equation is your A absorbance equals epsilon task plus uh, times past cell length, which is always one times uh, concentration plus whatever your calibration mark is. So for us, what you had to do is you simply had to plug in Okay, 0 0.25 into this equation. All right, so you would have gotten 0 0.25 is equal to 34.27. I'm gonna put C to remind me that X represents concentration, plus the calibration wasn't perfect, so 0 0.0032. And you would have solved for C, and what'd you get for C? Negative 0.14. Negative seven? That's negative two, number two, sorry. Okay. 2 times 10 to the negative two. Ooh. I, I see where the answers are practice problem too. Oh. And the first one is 7.2 times 10 to the negative third. Oh. 7.2 times 10 to the negative third. Okay, the second one was simply uh, looking at the equation and saying, okay, what if I was trying to compare absorbance one for one concentration to another absorbance of the same compound, right? Well, you would set, like we did with our ideal gas law, you would derive a secondary law from uh, the larger law and you would just say everything else is constant. So then you could create an initial versus final, A1 over A2 equals C1 over C2, okay? It's just a ratio relationship. And you simply would have plugged and chugged here and you would have found that X is equal to what? So you would have found that 0 0.400 all over 0 0.175 equals X all over 5.00 times 10 to the negative three. And what'd you get for X? Perfect. So this was all about mathematical manipulation, taking an equation that's a static equation, just like here's the general conditions, here's my values and turning into it a before and a before and final where we consider all other variables a constant and therefore treat it like a one, okay? We isolate the change. Okay, uh, and then finally, the last one was simply plug and chug. So you should have gotten for concentration, what'd you get for concentration?
What'd you get for concentration for this one? You would have set it up like this, 0 0.652 equals 15 liters all over centimeters per mole, which is the units for epsilon times 1.2. This was a unique path cell length times C. And what did you see it for C? 3.6 times 10 to the negative two. Cool. Okay. So quickly, let me go over sources of error that is kind of relevant to understanding uh, lab FRQ questions. I'm not going to read you all of this. You can read this on your own. Here's what I want you to know. Okay. Uh, common sources of error. Honestly, all of this is real basic. Okay. Um, errors that result in lower absorbance readings are the following. I'm just going to leave it at that. Errors that result in higher absorbance reading, so overestimation of concentration, are those. And errors that have no effect on absorbance reading are just putting too much sample in it. And I'm going to leave it at that because, honestly, that's something that you can look over in the last minute before the test and be like, oh, that kind of makes sense. Uh, molar absorptivity. And tomorrow you will not be tested on uh, errors in Beer's Law, which is also why I'm not like rushing to explain this. This is just generally for the AP, but you are not tested on this tomorrow. Uh, error, sources of errors. No, you're tested on not sources of errors of Beer's Law. Oh, we are tested on Beer's Law. You definitely are tested on Beer's Law. That's a hit. Yeah. Go. Remember, it's unit two, three combo. So. Um, I'm sorry. All right, guys. Really good work.